okay? So a little bit more complicated. This will be about as complicated as we get. I won't ask you to do Punnett squares and keep track of three genes. Um, but later on, if you take more bio classes in college or AP bio, you might actually do a couple of those. So how the heck do we do Punnett squares where we keep track of not one gene, but two genes? Pretty easy, actually. Just gotta become organized. In this example, flower color is governed by gene A, and plant height is governed by gene B. The alleles that specify pink flowers and tall height are dominant over those that specify white flowers and shorter height. In each plant, meiosis will produce gametes of a single genotype. Okay. So again, what just happened? Real simple. Here's our diploid genotype, right? And then we do meiosis, or the plant does meiosis. And look what's produced. Well, these are called gametes. Gametes are either sperm or egg cells, and these, of course, are haploid. You don't have both big A alleles, do you? You, either, you just have one. You don't have both big B alleles. You only have one. And again, that's because your tetrad split. Okay? Um, not a real interesting situation here, though, since all you have are big A's and big B's. These are the only possible gametes that this parent's going to produce. So whatever pollen's floating around in the wind here, or whatever pollen's stuck to a little bumblebee or something, it, it carries these two alleles. Same with the, uh, the other parent here. The only possible gametes will have little a, little b. There's no way that this plant will produce anything that has a big A or a big B. Okay? So not real interesting here, but the interesting thing will come up here in a second. Let's go ahead and uh, cross-pollinate here and see what the genotype is for the F1 offspring. When these gametes combine, they produce plants that are heterozygous at both loci and thus are purple-flowered and tall. During meiosis, alleles for genes A and B are assorted into gametes independently. All right, now it gets interesting. All right, here are the F1 plants. Remember, these were produced when we did this cross. We did big A, big A, big B, big B, cross with little A, little A, little B, little B. That means if you do your pun, I'm not even going to bother to do a pun, I'll do, a, do one here. All you're going to get is this cross with this. So that gives you that, right? The only possible genotype is that when these two plants are crossed. So it's pretty simple, straightforward. It's kind of like doing this, isn't it? Big A, big A, cross with little a, little a. Only possible genotype was that. Same idea, all right? This is the F1. Now, let's do meiosis. And look, you actually have four different gametes that could be produced now through meiosis. So, remember the two laws. The first law is the law of segregation. All that says is that this A and that A are going to separate from each other during meiosis. It also says that this B and this B are going to separate. The alleles are going to separate. And the amazing thing again is Mendel had no idea about meiosis, but he just reasoned it through, through analyzing his Punnett squares. And remember guys, this takes place during anaphase one. When the 
tetrad split. Now, here's the second law of Mendel. The law of independent assortment. And remember, assortment just means to arrange. This law deals with what happens during metaphase one, and we've talked about it before. So this isn't the first time you've heard it. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at this particular plant's genotype. What we actually have are two homologous chromosomes. One of them has a big A allele, right? Big A. The other homologous chromosome, the one that came from the other parent, has a little A allele, right? Little A. So remember, the one parent was this, the second parent was that. So this parent, this uh, particular plant, is still purple, but it's heterozygous purple. It has two different alleles. All right. Now let's go ahead and go to another pair of homologous chromosomes, and this is where we find the B alleles. One of them has the big B allele, the dominant allele. The other parent gave the little B allele. Okay? These are called the loci, the location of the alleles. All right, let's go ahead and duplicate our chromosomes. Let's go through the, uh, the S phase. That means we have a duplicated chromosome here, another duplicated chromosome here. Doesn't change anything, we just make copies. We're gonna duplicate these chromosomes. Awesome. Okay, now, this is metaphase one. Here's a tetrad, and let's say that these tetrad, this, this tetrad ends up over here, and this tetrad ends up over here. What's the, what are the two alleles gonna be inside this little gamete? Anybody? Yeah? Big A, Big A and what's the other allele gonna be? Okay. These end up going over here, and so we have little a, big B, right? But what happens if next time the plant does meiosis, which could happen in the next 10 minutes, what happens if we do this instead? Here's our tetrads. Let's say that this time, this chromosome with the little a's ends up on the left, and this chromosome with the big a's ends up on the right. Let's say that our B chromosomes here ended up assorting the same way. All right, now these end up being pulled apart that way. What's the gamete going to contain here? What two alleles? Big A and big B. Let's say the gametes get pulled apart this side. What are the two alleles going to have here? See how you now have one, two, three. You have four possible gametes that can be produced now, don't you? All right. As opposed to, you know, originally the parents here, the only gamete this parent could produce was this, right? This one could only produce that. Right? Now, why is it? Because of the law of independent assortment. Just by flipping your tetrads around, you get two brand new types of gametes. Okay? So, again, guys, the law of segregation just 